The funniest part is many atheists and agnostics think that there are no Christians in China. It's going to be over 100 million. And many are, fortunately, there, there are not many who are getting killed for their faith. It's more so fines, a little bit of jail time, but they do lose a lot. And so that type of giving up my, willingness to give up my life, willingness to sacrifice, humility saying, God, you move. I don't want to hoard things in my life, live for money, sex, or power. God uses that in an incredible way, and it makes total sense because Jesus Christ, the God of the universe himself, came as a servant, even a slave, in order to connect with us. And then his death started the catacombs and how many thousands upon thousands of Christians took over the Roman Empire. What would you say to a person that believes in another religion than Christianity and says that the New Testament is not in fact reliable? I'd say the New Testament is supported by evidence that it is reliable. What is that evidence? If you're going to raise the question of historical reliability, I think that's good. But you better think and you better come up with some tests that you use to determine historical reliability on any document. For myself, I've come up with four tests. Nothing magical about them, but I use them on the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, European history, African history books, U.S. history books. So I use them consistently. The four tests to determine historicity are literary style. Is it once upon a time in the land of Nod, Wink and Blink and an Odd took a boat ride? Is that history? Is that historical narrative? No. That is called fairy tale. All right? Are the Gospels once upon a time in the land of Nod? Jesus took a boat ride. No. The Gospels are at this time, in this place, with these people around, to witness this event, this occurred. It reads like the New York Times, the LA Times. It's historical narrative. That is the literary style. Second test, archaeology. Are we talking about the island of Atlantis that Jesus ran around on? No. We're talking about Bethlehem, Nazareth, Jerusalem, Rome, archaeologically verifiable places. Third test, internal consistency. Are these eyewitnesses contradicting each other? If they are, we got a problem with the text. I sure do. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are no contradictions. Are there different perspectives? Yes. Is there one angel in an empty tomb versus two angels in an empty tomb in a different gospel? Yes, there are. But the gospel that records that there is one angel never says there was only one angel. It's a different perspective, which is totally valid. We want different perspectives on any history. Fourthly, and most importantly for me personally is, how do we know that we have what those eyewitnesses wrote? Today, the New Testament that we have in English is based on over 5,700 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscripts dated from the 2nd through the 10th century AD, all agreeing to an infinitesimal degree. Does that mean the Bible's a word of God? No, absolutely not. Does that mean that the Gospels are historically reliable? Yes, absolutely yes. Well, come on, Cliff, show me that the Bible's a word of God. I can't. It's impossible to show that any book is the Word of God. How do you do that? It's impossible. But can I show you that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historically reliable? Yes, sir. So, if you're a skeptic, fine. But at least be open-minded and read the Gospel simply as history and ask yourself, does the historical evidence point to Jesus being a fraud? If it does, reject him. But if the Gospels point to the sanity, the reliability, the credibility of Jesus Christ, you better put your faith in him. Because what he claims is far too extreme for you to ignore him. Um, so I have some friends where we talk about like 
how they believe that women shouldn't be preachers or women shouldn't be able to talk about God. Yep. And how it talks about that in the Bible, or yep. maybe not that specifically. Right. And then other friends who are just like, why would someone say that? Like, why would someone want to, like, put women behind men? So yep. I just want to hear, like, your thoughts on that. And you bet. What you think. Well, Phoebe was trained by Paul, right? She was tremendously close. Paul raised her up as a leader who was preaching to men. Then you have an ancient manuscript where one Roman emperor wrote to another talking about how we have been persecuting and we have been slashing and doing things probably similar to waterboarding to this disciple of Christ who was a woman and disciple referencing her as a leader. So, women in leadership? Absolutely. Now, to the point of, were they specifically pastors? Well, the word pastor is not in the Bible. People, people don't believe me when I say that. Look up and try and find the word pastor in the Bible. It's not. We're both pastors, so sometimes we wonder, what in the world are we doing being pastors? It's not in the Bible. Now, women, though, in that Roman Empire, they were considered dirt. So were children. The typical male in the Roman Empire was allowed to have one sex slave, one wife, as well as another mistress, and treat them however he wanted to. No woman can go and say, hey, I'm part of the Me Too movement, for example. It was Christians that came along and said, no, we have to find a way to do away with this. We have to find a way to uplift women and say all are created in the image of God. That's when the Roman Empire started to change. And the majority of the early church and the church today is by far and away female. That's a great issue you're raising. Why? Because I meet a lot of women today who say, I am really angry about the sexism in our culture. And I look those ladies in the face and I say, I'm right with you. For a man to look down on a woman as inferior is sick. But the question is, why is woman valuable? And here's the answer that I get from too many of my feminist friends. Woman is valuable because she's just like a man. That's a pathetic reason that woman is valued. I hope, ladies, you don't think you're valuable because you're just like men. Because now you're still begging the question, why are men and women valuable? And I can promise you a woman is not valuable because she's just like a guy. No, false. The Bible gives us the basis for the value of every man, every woman, every transgender, every LGBTQ, every racist, every ethnic heritage person in the world. And the basis is God created every single one of us in his image. What do you think that man stood for? Exactly what I just said. Dr. Martin Luther King understood. All human beings are created in the image of God. That is why racism is wrong. Because racism is saying, I'm inferior, I'm superior, and you are inferior. And that is a lie. That is arrogance, it's demeaning a person. God created every single human being in his likeness, in his image. Which means we all have equal value and dignity. You take God out of the picture, and I'll tell you why woman's valuable. Because our culture says, if your body's proportioned correctly, you're a babe. You're valuable. What a crock. Our culture says, man, if you've been in a weight room a lot and you're buff, you're a stud. You're somebody significant. That's a lie. Our culture says, if you've got a 4.0 GPA, whoa, you're somebody. That's a lie. I've got a sister with, who's mentally challenged. I got a brother who transplants kidneys at Duke University Hospital in North Carolina. I can promise you, my brother, who's a transplant surgeon, is not more valuable than my sister, who's at a third grade educational level at the age of 59. And if anybody goes to my brother and says, whoa, you know, you're really valuable, and your sister, who's mentally challenged, is a loser, my brother intellectually will bust the dude's chops. Why? Because you've got to think. Why are any of us valuable? If there is no God, none of us are valuable innately. We just give ourselves value, or our culture gives us value, if we happen to be a winner instead of a loser. Guys, 
think. You've got to think this stuff through. No God, you're an accident, I'm an accident. If there is a God who created you in his image, you and I both have intrinsic, innate value. It's that simple. But what about salvation? Why, God already knows who's going to be saved and who isn't, so why is that not the Good. For the same reason that God knows what I'm going to choose to do tomorrow when it comes to how I treat students out here, because he's outside of the dimension of time, God knows whether I'm going to choose to accept Christ and put my faith in him. And he knows that about you and about all of us. He's all-knowing. He's outside of the dimension of time. The idea that I'm just going to keep on living and living and living is a joke. I'm 69 years old. I can promise you I can't run as fast as I used to. I can't jump as high as I used to. This body is decaying. That's a fact, right? Yeah. So I am locked into time, and time does things to my body. Time does things to life. God is outside of that dimension of time. He's eternal. All right. See, God doesn't get tired. I get tired. God doesn't get tired. The four Gospels are the story of Jesus, and we want to make sure it's accurate. How come there's some inconsistencies between the four of them? For example, um, the one I'm thinking of is like the story of the fig tree. Um, Jesus like curses a fig tree, and one Gospel says it, it withered immediately, and then one Gospel said later on in the day it was withered. So there's some, and there's another one with like, um, like the genealogy of Christ. There's yep. two different genealogies That's and they're right. different. Yep. So how do we, how can we still like trust the gospel if there's those inconsistencies? Good question. When you talk about inconsistencies, read them carefully. Realize that perspective is crucial. You and I are standing on a street corner. We see two cars come down the road. There's a screech of brakes, a woman screams, and there's a collision. If you and I go to the police and you say, officer, I saw the two cars coming down the street, a woman screamed and there was a collision. And I say, officer, I saw the two cars coming down the street, I heard a screech of brakes and there was a collision. Are you and I contradicting each other? No. No. Exactly. We are offering two equally valid perspectives on what really happened. There's a book called The Day Lincoln Was Shot. Does that book record every second of Lincoln's last 24 hours? Every thought, every imagination, every deed? No. What is history? History is a selective account of what happens. No history book gives us every detail. None. That is why we want different eyewitness accounts to get different perspectives on what really happened. Now if you have a contradiction in a text, then we have got a problem. But I would argue that the two genealogies in Luke 3 and Matthew 1 do not contradict each other. There are some options. One option that I take seriously is, one of Luke's main points is, Jesus was not born literally, physically, as a son of Joseph. He was born of a virgin, Mary. And so Luke gives us Mary's genealogy, tracing back to Abraham, and Matthew gives us Joseph's genealogy, tracing back to Abraham showing that clearly from both Mary's lineage and, Matthew, and Joseph's lineage, Jesus was the line of Messiah. The fig tree, when you have words like immediately or at the end of the day, be very careful there, very careful. Right? I mean, immediately, what does immediately mean? Mark continuously in the Gospel of Mark says, and immediately, right away, Jesus went and did this. Well, that doesn't mean that he literally just right away went and did that. Mark is, is a writer who uses a lot of action, and Jesus is bopping around. He's writing for Romans who are action-oriented people, and so Mark records that. Well, and also, the disciples had different perspectives, right? There wasn't collusion going on. They weren't always in the same place at the same time. So one Gospel writer could say, I heard happened immediately, but for me, it was later on in the day. 
So remember that I love that because it's not collusion. It's like the angels at the tomb, right? Just because somebody says there was an angel at the tomb and somebody comes along and says, I saw two angels. Doesn't mean they're contradicting themselves. It just means the guy who came later or the woman who came later encountered two and the first guy only had encountered one and talked about the one and didn't talk about the second. So that type of difference, see, if you had a certain holy book that says this is given by God and every single word has to be perfect, there's no male or female perspective on things, humanity is not in here. See, that is way tougher when it comes to looking at things like supposed contradictions or supposed sloppiness. Because don't forget, there are thousands upon thousands of variants that are misspelled grammatically in the Bible. And that can scare people's faith. But then you look at it, and not a single theological issue is changed by those variants. And so I love the different perspectives that appear to be contradictions at times. But then you understand, no, these are different people from different perspectives. So that's important, rather than everybody just saying, yep, here we go. It was 3 o'clock, and we were all here at the fig tree, and this is exactly what happened. And we're going to write it in the exact same way, with the exact same punctuation. Then you start to say, wow. This probably did not happen. <laughs> so if the Bible was written by people who were living humans, was not written by God himself, yep. then what is stopping us from adding more into the Bible today? Like, what is stopping me from writing more letters as if I'm the Apostle Paul? Like, what is stopping that? That's a great question. Because Christ came at a specific time and said, here are specific words, gave these words to the disciples, many of whom were obviously living with him, not all 72. But they said, okay, well now we're going to make disciples of all nations. But you have the Gnostic Gospels and other Gospels coming later. Now you have not history, you have great hyperbole. You have extremism of character and personality, and no ancient historian would say, oh, that's written as history. So the book eventually has to be closed, right? Because Jesus came at a specific place in time. The God of the universe came at a specific place in time, said, I am going to pass this message off to those who've encountered me and then to those who are close friends with those who've encountered me, the eyewitnesses. And now the message is here and it's getting out. I'm going to ascend to the Father. And so we, we've got to close these manuscripts. We've got to close these gospels or people who had no connection to Christ, are, are going to write later, and then things are going to get sullied in that way. So that's, that's one reason. You've got to think through, why is the New Testament made up of just four Gospels? Because there were a lot of alternatives, especially over a few hundred years. Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Pontius Pilate, Gospel of Mary. Okay, so what criteria did the first, second, third century use to include and to exclude certain Gospels? First point, it had to be written by an eyewitness or by someone who knew an eyewitness. Well, somebody writes today, Jesus was a Republican. I'm sorry, you never met Jesus? Obviously, the Republican Party did not even exist back then. So no, Jesus was not a Republican or a Democrat. He wasn't a Democrat either, okay? And Jesus didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, right? He was a Jew. So you gotta be real careful. So the first test, to be included in the New Testament was written by an eyewitness or someone who knew an eyewitness. Luke was not an eyewitness, but Luke knew eyewitnesses. Second test was, does this document agree with Orthodox Christian faith? The Gnostic Gospels contradict Orthodox Christian faith. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Barnabas are based on Gnostic philosophy, which teaches your body, evil, your spirit, good. Get rid of your body, because it's the spirit that's good. And that contradicts the Bible. The Bible insists God created both your body and your spirit. So, a lot of the Gospels, quote unquote, reject either the Orthodox Christian faith, or they were not written by an eyewitness or by someone who knew an eyewitness. That is why they were excluded from the New Testament. And that's why if somebody writes a document today, it's obviously not going to be written by an eyewitness or somebody who knew an eyewitness. Thanks for raising that issue. So Jesus told the rich guy, if you want to like follow me, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Yeah. And they talked about the camel and the eye of the needle. Yep. So is money evil? Like is living and luxury bad? And uh, what should we do? Like how should we function in that way? Because we need money to live, right? 
<laughs> we sure do. Okay, so is money evil? No. But in 1 Timothy 6.10 we read, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And guess what? You can be dirt poor and love money. And you can be one of the wealthiest billionaires in the world and love money. So the issue is not money itself. The issue is your attitude. What's going on in your heart? So, what does the Bible teach about money? First of all, don't gamble. Why? Because money's valuable. Don't play games with your money. Invest wisely, save, be shrewd. Secondly, make what you can and save as much as you can. Saving is good. It's being shrewd in handling your money. But thirdly, give as much away as you can because Christ calls us to be generous. Fourthly, am I concerned about the issue of money in my life, in the life of every American Christian? You bet I am. You know, I'm really embarrassed the way Christians 200 years ago had slaves in the United States, took them to church on Sunday. That's sick, tragic. But guess what? 100 years from now, Christians might be embarrassed by me over how much money I kept for myself. So we got to be real shrewd. We got to really pray about work making money. Why? Because we all appreciate money. And money is very important. All right? Don't gamble, which is trivializing money. It's saying, I can play a game with money. No, no, no. Money is a gift from God. It represents your labor, your work. So work hard, make money. Save for a rainy day. Provide for your spouse, your children, maybe even your grandchildren. But do not live for it. And what's tragic is when people say to me on a university campus here in the United States, I don't believe in God. And I ask them, okay, fine, I understand. So what do you believe in? And they say, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't believe in anything. I have to look them in the face and say, you know something? You're lying to yourself as well as to me. Because you and I both know why you're here at this fine university. is to position yourself so you can make more money. So don't give me this crock that you're not living for anything, that you don't have faith. You got incredible faith. You're convinced that the purpose of your life is to make money as much as you can. Now, if you're willing to think about that a little more deeply, you'll realize how superficial and trivial that is. Because what you're saying is, money is more important than people. And you know better than that. You know better than that. Not only that, Bill Gates, after a conference, speaking at a conference, was asked, if you lost your eyesight, and you could get your eyesight back, but you'd have to give up all your money to get it back, would you do it? And Bill Gates said, absolutely. Sir, your eyesight is more important than billions of dollars, isn't it? That is why it is so foolish and stupid to reduce the purpose of life to making money. Now, is making money important? Of course it is. Why? Because it symbolizes work. It's what you get for your work. And guess what? God created you and me to work, to join him in the creative enterprise, and that is good. But to reduce money, to reduce the purpose of life to being making money? Oh, what a superficial, trivial existence you're living. Jesus says, no, don't cheapen yourself that way. Live to love God and live to love people and live in relationship with God, in relationships with people. That's really living. When, when he talks too about, you must hate your father and mother in order to follow me and truly love me. Let the dead bury their own dead. He's obviously speaking in hyperbolic language. He oftentimes speak in metaphor. We have apocalyptic literature over in Revelation. So he's stressing a point in terms of don't live for wealth, serve me with everything you have because I have to be number one in your life in order to love your parents. Because if he's saying hate your parents, that's simply what he's saying. In your love for me, it has to almost look like such great intensity that you hate your parents. That's how much more you're supposed to love me than your parents. And you say, oh gosh, that's extreme. I really love my parents. You know? I love my dad over here. We're doing this together. But if you have God as number one, that will give you an opportunity to love everything else in your life 
in a bet much better way where you can actually flourish. Think about this one, for example. In our town, we have many people who would say, many parents who would say, oh, yeah, you, you know what? I'm only as happy as my least happy child. You think, wow, okay, there's something to that. I, I can empathize to an extent. But what if that child dies? Is that person just going to give up? Are they going to commit suicide? Or what about if I love my child that much as God, I'm going to suck the life out of that child. They're going to eventually get embittered and hate me. Or there's going to be some weird enmeshment going on, and that child's never going to be able to live their own life. So putting God as number one, going and selling everything you have in a type of hyperbolic language, saying, you have to love me that much more than your possessions. You have to love me that much more than your parents, in terms of let the dead bury their own dead, unless you hate your father and mother, you can't be a disciple. That's what he's talking about in how much you need to love him. And the weird thing is, the more you do that, the more fun you'll have in life. The better your life will be, especially when going through suffering. Because you can't take money, you can't take your family, you can't take your friends, you can't take your integrity, your intelligence, you can't take anything from this earth to heaven. All of that is finite. God is infinite. I am one of the most blessed fathers in the world. I get to work with my son, and I love the living daylights out of him. If I idolize him and turn him into God, that's tragic, absolutely tragic. And he's got to know that I want him to go wherever God calls him. I hope we can minister together for many years to come. But if God calls him somewhere else, he's got to go. Because God is God, I'm not his God, and he's not my God. And he's already going over very well enmeshment and how messy it gets when you worship your family. And the tragic thing is there are too many wonderful Americans who live for their family. Family's awesome. It's not God. And every family's dysfunctional, beginning with mine. Okay, we all have problems. Why? Because we're all sinners. All right? But man, I love this guy, and I'm having a blast working with him. And I hope we can do it for many years. But that's God's determining, not mine. And that brings health to our relationship, not enmeshment. Thanks for raising that more personal question. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.